Hello, everyone, and welcome again to our Revenue Maverick uh, Community Program. And a very special welcome to Anil Sumani. We're very excited to have you. Uh, you're a great addition to our Revenue Maverick Program, so we appreciate you taking the time to contribute to this community. Uh, thank you. Excited to be here. I'm Ed Rizzani. I'm your host, and I am a, a Revenue Maverick Advisor. Um, and for the audience today, I would love to introduce you to Anil. He is the Senior Vice President of Revenue Operations at Chargebee. Anil is the Flywheel Revenue Executive. And those of you that know Anil, he has held many leadership operational roles across many companies in his career, and most recently coming from Plural Side. He is very passionate about architecting the go-to-market engine and the flywheel. He is uh, quite the fine-tuner professional that aims to optimize the outputs. Uh, he's also very passionate um, about um, growing and developing people, both internally and externally. So we're very excited to listen to what he has prepared for our community today. Anil, in the program today, uh, we'll love to hear from you on how you're thinking about the revenue engine holistically. And then I know you have prepared the three metrics that have made a difference in, in your career that you wish to kind of talk about and share with the rest of the community. So uh, without any further ado, the floor is yours. We'll love to hear from you. Excellent. Thank you. So I appreciate the uh, the introduction. Um, let's just jump right into it. So I, I wanted to build a slide to start framing up revenue operations and some of the transition of revenue operations in the past couple of years. And what I personally believe is going to be the continued growth of revenue operations and, and the importance of RevOps uh, just over the next few years. And so on the left side of this, you'll see some of the challenges that businesses face right now uh, around not having a full stack revenue operation. So from my perspective, I see RevOps carrying forward all the way from the front side of marketing to business development, into sales, into customer success. And what a lot of companies have, and this has surprised me a little bit, but are these siloed operations organizations where You've got marketing reporting a set of metrics. You've got sales and BD reporting a different set and then CS reporting a different set. And many times those metrics are calculated differently. They're positioned differently and they cause these organizations to be at odds with each other. And so one of the things RevOps can actually do is, is start bringing all of that together. What are the data sources? What are the calculations? Um, that comes across in strategies. A lot of companies have you know, these large initiatives that they're trying to, you know, bring and execute across all the different groups. Uh, so for example, a strategy of wanting to drive up market into enterprise and strategic segments. That spans across every one of those, marketing, BD, sales, and CS. And it has to be coordinated. And RevOps can be those coordinators. I think everyone's challenged with technology and where uh, the tech landscape is going or has gone. Um, I think everyone has seen that chart of a thousand different vendors and different buckets. Um, it's tough to pick a tech tool today. Um, and then, you know, on top of all that, and probably the most important is the customer experience, right? Thinking about putting the customer front and center. Um, so if you look at the middle part of this, this is how I think about any one large initiative coming into RevOps, right? So after all of those challenged in comes RevOps. So the center of that, you know, if we think about what is working, you know, what is the working relationship today and how do we want it to work? So um, RevOps is just crucial in that strategic piece. And then you keep wheeling around over to the right. But once you determine the way you want it to work, are the incentives aligned right behind that, right? Do we have the right comp plan? Is it a SPIF? So do we need something short term to help drive that? Um, and then behind that, the enablement, do the sales team, the CS team, the BD team, know the words to say, if we continue to use that same example of driving up market, um, you know, from an enablement perspective, does the business development team know what the trends are in the marketplace up market? Do they know what to say? Do they know how to engage with the CIO, CTO of, of these large companies? The fourth part of that is developing reports to adjust the performance uh, or to measure and adjust the performance. That famous saying, you, 
you can't actually influence what you can't report and measure. So that's that fourth piece. And then you continuously optimize this. And then from a RevOps perspective, it's a big blue. Um, so really, you know, from a from a strategic perspective, RevOps role is is in the center of that, right? They're the ones architecting all of those pieces, coordinating with the different functions uh, and, and departments to kind of help drive that and optimize it. Um, if you think about, you know, how that influences and, and the impact of all of that, um, we talked about it, right? The single source of truth, real-time visibility. And one of the keys with real-time visibility is giving you the ability then to make rapid adjustments, right? So if you're reviewing any one of these things on a weekly basis, you then can go to a CFO and say, okay, look, let's go AB test this. Let's go try this and stop this and see if that works. Um, clarity across handoffs, right? The SLAs, it's always, a, it's a notorious one between marketing and BD and AEs. What are the SLAs? How many times do they call? How quickly do they call? Um, and then, you know, just the refined feedback loops. And I think people think about feedback loops into marketing and into sales, but there's also a feedback loop into product, right? Like if, if all of this is architected properly, what is product's way of hearing about you know, the interactions from a field perspective? So um, I think you're seeing this trend really emerge. And I actually think that the importance placed on RevOps is going to be highlighted here over the next few years. Thank you for sharing this one. I think it's a very good point that you brought up uh, in, in kind of trying to set the stage of what is the purpose of a, a revenue operation team. I think there's a, a lot of misconception today still in the market that people think it's revenue operation and sales ops when they don't understand actually sales ops is just one of the pieces of the full revenue engine, right? Um, and so maybe one question for you is, since you've seen this many times, um, can you help us recognize some of the side effects or the pains that organizations may have or are going to experience if they don't follow the revenue centric uh, operational mindset that you just talked about? If you don't do this, you should experience the following so that maybe they can realize maybe I have those pains today. It is a bit surprising to me how many companies still operate in that siloed framework. Um, and the pain just becomes extremely evident because you're not following the customer journey. So I think your CFO will probably feel the first amount of pain, right? In that he or she is going to start asking for, when I put a penny in the marketing machine, what is the output I get? And, you know, if it's a fragmented organization, the marketing team will tell you, hey, I get 10 leads. Well, that's great. CFO is going to ask you, how much in bookings do I get? How much in retention do I, what does it mean to the number of meetings? So I, I think it's the overarching uh, discussion and the lack of visibility and transparency in that is what you'll be missing. And not to mention the lack of strategic direction. Um, I think the departments will be a conflict. You'll see them fighting a little bit around metrics, things like that. Yeah, totally. I think there's a lot of people that probably experienced those pains. Okay, yeah. thank you for this. Uh, we're ready to see your first metrics. Let's talk about that. It's actually a metric that Battery Ventures just recently put together, um, and it's, it's called the Mojo metric. And for me, this is a bellwether metric on, on the pipeline health. And if you think about this metric, um, it's essentially positive pipeline, new pipeline on a week in, week out basis, minus negative pipeline. And positive pipeline is new and existing pipeline, plus any pull forward that you've had for the week minus negative pipeline, which is anything that's been pushed, deals that have shrunk or have been lost. And in this chart, you can see they've had a couple of uh, rough weeks of pipeline, right? They're below that zero dollar because the red bucket of lost pipeline or negative pipeline is larger than the green. Um, but what you'll start to see in any one business is really generally the trend that pipeline is on. And we all know based upon you know, um, historical close rates and ASPs and cycle times, you know, how this translates out into then bookings, right? Pipeline's really the energy of most companies. And, and this gives you a really good sniff test on how that's going. And, and behind this, I would say driving it down to a segment level, driving it down to a geo level, driving it down to a source level is extremely important, right? Because then you can start driving into what's working and what's not by each one of those functions. Um, it really gives you a good, a good test of how healthy the pipeline is. Um, the other thing is you, as you start looking at this, I mean, this is only five weeks in the chart that we've shown here, 
Uh, but it starts giving you a good feel as to the trending, right? And what you can expect. Imagine if you had this, uh, you know, for 13 weeks of a Q1 and 13 weeks of the previous Q1, then you can start comparing of, okay, hey, this trend, first two weeks is always slow. You got the sellers coming back from holidays. You know, the BDRs aren't quite clicking. Maybe the customers aren't back yet. Uh, and you see that in the previous years and, and you can start kind of trending it out for this year as well. Um, it also will start talking to you a little bit around the pipeline hygiene um, and where you need to squeeze and press on the different organizations and where you need to look a little bit uh, deeper in terms of inspecting the hygiene portion of it. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I like the fact that, you know, that you can see, you know, both the good and the, and so to speak, uh, maybe the negative that occurs. Um, when I look at this scenario, at least in this hypothetical uh, data scenario, you can tell like this first month, uh, uh, we were maybe trying to get our ducks in a row, figure out maybe a new process. Maybe we launched something new that is still trying to to engage and then it starts taking form, start picking, picking a momentum. Um, in scenarios maybe like this one, what types of conversation, um, maybe if you want to give us an example or two, have you been able to um, see and maybe um, something that you would ever say, these are the type of conversation that you could expect if you share this type of metric. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is like, if you think about calendar, you know, a calendar year, and, and this is a January, a lot of companies pipeline probably look like this, right? That sellers are coming back. A lot of times there's a, you know, RKO, SKO going on. There's a lot of enablement. Uh, there's, there's just a ton going on in those first couple of weeks. So I, I don't think this is unusual for a January. One of the things I really like to have is a weekly pipeline cadence. Um, and in that meeting, you've got the individual pipeline sources coming in. So, you know, BD, channel, sales, and marketing coming in and having a discussion of their weekly targets and really simply asking three questions or answering three questions. What happened? And this is on a weekly basis. What happened? why did it happen and what are you going to go do about it once you understand the what and the why then you can start going to what is the action plan and for each source each geo it's going to be a little bit different but at least you start framing to action rather than oh my gosh it's red and we don't know what to do i think you just called out of something very important sometimes when you see charts maybe have red or something that indicates the negative uh, maybe there is the the human side of us or from a leadership perspective we start panicking we start focusing immediately, we're doing bad, everything is negative. I like what you're saying that we actually focus on actions that, look, uh, the data is unemotional in a sense, is simply telling us that uh, something can be corrected. And so it's more valuable for us to focus on what can we do about it and how can we make the change in momentum to get in the right direction, because as long as we can move that pivot, then we can actually get some good results out of it. So, I think that's a very good point to, to kind of focus on what are you going to do versus freaking out or being very negative about the current scenario. Yeah, a non-emotional data-driven discussion is absolutely where you want to go and, and an action plan behind that, right? So I'm, I'm less interested in the what and the why that it happened and more about what you're going to do about it during those discussions. So, okay. um, so this is snap the line um, and this is a forecasting accuracy metric. Um, essentially, what this measures is end of quarter variance against the week six call. So if your end of quarter number is a million dollars, uh, or let's call it $1.3 million, and your week six call was a million dollars, right? And then you were 300K over, then there'd be a positive percent to variance there, right? Of 30%. Um, and vice versa. So you'd be in the green in that first scenario and vice versa. If you ended up at 700K, you'd have that same 300K variance uh, and it would be negative and you'd have a red variance in here. So really what I'm looking for here is a couple of things. A salesperson's or a sales leader's ability to call their number in an accurate fashion at week six, right? So weeks one and two are always pipeline cleaning and you'll see a ton of pipe movement from the previous quarter. Uh, you'll see deal shaking a little bit. Um, it's just early in the quarter, right? But then about week six is halfway through the quarter. We should have a pretty good handle on what's going to happen along with a little bit of judgment. There's a certain amount of range that you allow. I think some companies are pretty tight on this range. Um, I like to see a minus five to plus 10 variance. So you can be 95% of your call or 110% of your call. And, and that's within the tolerance level. 
Um, I do think it's important to look at this, again, those same cuts, right, by geo, by segment. And you can start then understanding the, you know, the forecast accuracy of each one of our leaders. So if you take the geo example here, uh, North America was at 95, kind of right within that tolerance, where EMEA was a positive 102. So both of those were in a pretty good tolerance level, whereas the APAC region in here uh, missed pretty badly, missed by 14% to 14 points, uh, and were well below their call. And so then, you know, sitting down and understanding what happened, the same thing, right? Why did it happen and what are you going to do about it is a really important thing in this scenario. I also think it helps you calibrate uh, forecasting methodology with your leaders. Now, if your APAC leader comes back and, and this is the third quarter that they've had something like this, and you probably don't want to wait till the third quarter, right? You probably want to ask yourself right. what happened um, and, you know, do you have your deals um, staged properly? Here's what it means to be in a commit stage for me. What does it mean for you? And are you enforcing it? Starting to ask that next level down with the questions. And, and then finally, I'd tell you, you know, as you start seeing these trends, uh, you can start, you know, looking at it and start giving confidence to your CFO and, and to, you know, your CEO of the bookings forecast. You're calling now something very interesting here. Um, you know, talking about the scenario, maybe don't want to wait for number three for the same storyline in a sense. What type of cadence weekly activity uh, do you expect the reps or the leaders to do in order to position them to make a, a call within the accuracy that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I think um, it's different for each business, right? I mean, depending on the sales cycle and depending on the product and, uh, you know, a lot of companies have this really fast transaction velocity business that they create pipe and they close it very quickly in quarter. Uh, but I would say generally a weekly cadence by segment is what I look for. And, and that weekly cadence is sales manager with their sales rep and depending on the levels, right? Sales manager with their director and director with their VP and then VP with us sitting down and being able to make those calls, but also digging into the large deals, right? There should be a large deal component reviewed in here where they're sitting and poking at where they're at in the cycle and where the executive team can help and those types of things. With this type of uh, metric of snap of the line, this cadence is established. How often do you see that um, they start establishing that culture of being within that frame? Uh, or is this more of a hit and miss throughout the year? No, I, I think the goal is to start bringing everybody within that tolerance level. So I would go back and I would look historically to start developing that tolerance level, right? This minus five to plus 10 is also a little different by company. Uh, but I would look at some of those historical trends and look at where traditionally leaders have been and then drive and deliver your tolerance level or establish your tolerance level. And then the goal would be, you know, over a period of six to 12 months to start bringing and set the expectation that leaders should be within that range. Um, and, and, you know, the range insinuates that it's equally bad to call a higher number versus a lower number, right? So we want you to be able to forecast accurately or sales stages and forecasting methodology there to help you with that. But we need you in this tolerance to be able to deliver predictability on the business. That makes sense. Last question on this one, because I think a lot of uh, both operators and as well as maybe RVPs or these uh, middle top management in the sales side of things will probably ask themselves these questions. Are there very specific things that drive that accuracy? Is it maybe a forecasting methodology like a Matic, MadPick, uh, or, or other things besides just hygiene in the CRM that, that can help with that accuracy that you would recommend start looking into or maybe embracing? Mm -hmm. I think it's um, it's also big deals, right? So if you're a strategic segment leader where uh, you only have five deals a quarter, if one of them moves and all of a sudden, you know, your number is going to look a little bit differently, right? But I think it's also sitting down and maybe even skip level, right? If you're a VP going all the way down to the IC and reviewing the top 20 deals across your business and understanding where they're at in the motion, where you can help. Uh, do you need additional help where you're getting hung up? Are they pacing well? Are they coming to the next event? I think this opens up just a whole host of questions and uh, inspections, the wrong word, but getting into the middle of the deal and being able to help kind of facilitate the flow of that deal. I guess we could say if they're not inspecting, they should be at least unpacking the deal. There you go.
There's a better word. There's a better word. Okay. All right. <laughs> We're ready for metric number three. Let's jump let's, into it. Let's do it. Um, all right. So this is good old LTV to CAC. I'm sure most uh, everyone has heard about this. And, and this trend is a very, very optimistic as we as we did the sample chart. It's a very yes. optimistic one, right? But I wanted to kind of show the trend over a period of time and show the impact of it, right? Um, so LTV to CAC is just the lifetime value of a customer uh, divided out by the customer acquisition cost. Um, I've had a couple questions of, you know, just traditionally, what's the target? And traditionally, this is operated as a three to one. Again, different businesses run a little bit differently and set internal targets a little bit differently. Um, but for me, this is one of the most important indicators um, of just a company's health and well being and how well they're operating, how productive they're operating and efficient they're operating. Um, but as well as, you know, kind of their potential for growth. So in, in this scenario uh, that's highlighted here, you can see they are doing a phenomenal job of growing the, the lifetime value of a the customer. Um, they're either keeping them longer, they're selling them larger deals, all that good stuff. Um, but they're keeping their cost basis the same, right? And it's going up slightly there, but they're keeping their cost basis relatively the same. Uh, so th this is a company that, you know, if the VCRP firm was to look at, uh, they definitely would take a second, second look at. Um, but it also, you know, helps you understand kind of those leverage points between um, the value of a customer, the cost to acquire one, and how you can play with those different numbers, right? Because there's two ways to get to that orange line. It's getting a higher lifetime value or driving costs out of the business. Um, and doing so lets you kind of make some of those faster decisions. So I, I just feel like this is one of those good old fashioned SaaS metrics that um, I think everyone should be looking at. Um, and again, at a segment level, at a geo level, right? Driving this down geo is a little bit tough, but at a segment level to the extent you can allocate costs and uh, is also another just really good one. Yes, uh, I, I think this is very important now. Um, from the community, one of the things we noticed that a lot of them are not yet using uh, the LTV or CAC ratio uh, type of metric. I think, uh, especially in SaaS, there's probably a little more of a presence of this metric, uh, but a lot of people are learning a bit. So uh, for those of you that are listening, another way that it's been often uh, simplified is in order to calculate a ride, just think about your cost versus margin. So that's another way to think about it. This is definitely a, a beautiful unicorn that everybody wants to go in IPO and purchase out, right? Um, one question is that um, we are often asked about this type of metric is, what are the toughest pieces of the numbers that need to be put in place to get the right cost of a customer, right? That CAC piece. Uh, what have you found in your career that um, are some of the most difficult one to really pin down? And when you say pin down, you're talking about influence or actually uh, in the calculation? Calculate, yeah. in the calculation. Yeah, I, I think there's, you know, there's a host of kind of GNA type stuff that everyone debates on, you know, should they be included in the number, should they not? Sometimes you'll hear things like, Hey, I've got a marketing person that does, you know, uh, SEO, but does it across all segments. Do I evenly allocate his or her time across by segment? They work more on strategic class on SMB. You can debate all day what goes to the cost side of this equation. Uh, my perspective is as long as you do this in a consistent fashion in this scenario, it's, as long as you're doing it and reporting it consistently, seven years consistently, year over year over year, and you're improving the trend, then that's all I'm looking for, thumbs up, right? So um, I worry a little, bit, a little bit less about what all's included in the math and more about what is the trend over a period of time and is that trend improving? Okay, uh, a follow-up question to that one often comes is, uh, which stakeholders in the business um, should you work closely to define it? Is it just the CFO? Is it the chief customer officer for, uh, you know, implementation and, and, and retention? Or are there other leaders that should be part of that decision on what the cost of acquisition is? Yeah, I, I think the CFO generally holds the deciding factor, holds the gavel on it, um, and, and should be crucial in creating this formula. Uh, but I think socialization across the, you know, the CMO, the CRO, the CCO, kind of um, the head of RevOps, all those individuals, uh, they all have to be bought into the formula. 
And again, for me, more importantly is once you get it, what are you doing with it? When you see this type of trend, the discussion, if you see a bottom right trend, what are you doing about it? Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Okay, is there anything else that, uh, based on what you wanted to share about these three metrics that maybe you want to say before we kind of wrap our podcast today? No, I, I, I would just say, you know, with, um, with one of the closing comments, you can get um, overwhelmed with the set of metrics, right? I, I've seen businesses go in and they calculate 150 different metrics and then they sit down week over week or then they just stop sitting down and stop looking at metrics. Um, I would really spend the time to discuss what are the key drivers, what are the key metrics that you want the executive team or you want the team looking at on a week in, week out basis. Clearly define the calculations, the data sources, and then who should be looking at them. Um, and that list can't be 150, right? You can't influence 150. And shift the discussion from the calculation and the, the who reports on it and all that to what are you going to go do about it uh, would be my feedback. Very well said. Um, uh, we've heard other people say, you know, you can get lost in the metric, right? And so measure what matters. So I think it's very good point that you're bringing up. So thanks for sharing that one. Yeah, of course. Um, Anil, look, uh, this is always, always a pleasure connecting with you and, and learning from you. Uh, one of the things that I would love to kind of ask you, um, get your advice on since, uh, you know, we have different type of audiences on, on, on this community. One would be, think about in terms of someone that is young in their careers that maybe are just starting, maybe they're an analyst, maybe they're a manager in sales, uh, regardless of where they sit and, and they're trying to become more, more of a flywheel executive like yourself over time, right? What are some of the advice from a career journey perspective that you would give them to maybe look into you or consider in order to make themselves more well-rounded like you described in the first slide? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a couple things like the going back to, you know, any one analysis that comes out, um, most people nowadays have the ability to go and calculate the analysis, to go and pull the data, calculate the analysis and, and put out a number or a spreadsheet or a report, right? Um, the, the really valuable folks at, at an analyst level, right, for me are the ones that can really go do that and then come back and say, hey, Neil, like this trend is, is going the wrong way. And I see it going wrong in EMEA and your mid business. Uh, and here is what I think you need to do about it. Here are three ideas that I think you need to go do. Um, and they're thinking about it holistically, right? They're thinking about the full journey. They're not looking at any one specific area. They're thinking about the full journey. And I think those are the individuals that have that really inquisitive nature, but are also proactive in you know, establishing three recommendations. Uh, are the ones that really start then elevating and accelerating their career because then then they get pulled into the solutioning, right? Because th then my next thing would be to to push on it, to challenge it a little bit and then say, okay, hey, look, like go present this to X, Y, and Z. Uh, and now immediately they're getting all the exposure, they're getting all the, you know, they're a part of the solution. And, and I think that's just really valuable for them. I agree, yeah. Flip the mentality of just building reports to actually automated reports and start spending more time in creating insight that can insight. be generating conversations and actions, right? Yeah. Um, one more question on this one, and, and then we'll let you go, but the revenue operation role, to your point, in the next a few months, if maybe a few years, uh, it will start to become probably for some organization that never really emphasized it or invested into more of a predominant role. Uh, there are organizations today that already invested in it. Um, one of the th critical things that I think leaders like yourself have to do is try to kind of brand and re recognize the value that this organization is bringing. Um, what advice do you have to other leaders to say, this is this is how often in the type of democratization you need to do, you know, to say, look, uh, we're making a difference on the bottom line. Um, what would you advise people to consider and do? I'd say start now. Um, I was a little surprised um, over the past six months with different companies that I've spoken with that don't have a unbiased third party looking at the full customer journey and life cycle. I was really surprised that still had this very siloed kind of approach. Um, so my advice or my feedback would be start now, pull a person out, 
and ask them to really start thinking about it across the life cycle and across the journey. Because uh, if you don't, I've, I've seen companies grow from 200 million to a billion and I've seen the mistakes they made. Um, and the siloed approach is one of those big things that I think causes a ton of friction, uh, causes companies to move a little bit slower. Uh, I think companies that are 10 and $20 million, my advice would be just go do it now, invest in the resource. That's a good advice. Thank you. Well, Anil, uh, thank you so much for all your insight today. Everybody, if you wish to connect with Anil, and I'm sure he will be more than happy to connect with you via LinkedIn and uh, provide his expertise and advice to, to you and, and help you guys grow. So feel free to reach out to him via LinkedIn. And uh, thank you again for your time and preparation for today. We're, we're excited to set this live and, and, and share this with the rest of the community. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for everybody that has been listening. And we wish you all a wonderful day. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.